Hello, friends. Stacey Eldridge here. Welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast. Today is Monday, October 26th, and I'm in the studio with my husband, John. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to part two, and there may be even a part three, the conversation that we began last week around the shaking in the world, the shaking in American politics, and particularly, how do we think about the election? How do we pray about it? Getting our eyes on Jesus. And if you listened to last week's, you'll remember that we had been hearing from Jesus a number of times as we were praying and asking, eyes on me, hearts on me. And that's just such a beautiful, beautiful place to be. And we received a number of beautiful comments from you all that that last week was helpful to get. It really is the key in order to navigate our lives and navigate these days. Eyes on me, hearts on me. Eyes on Jesus, hearts on Jesus. So we're actually going to pick up one of the passages we read last week was from Isaiah 40. And we're going to pick up with that to build momentum into this week. But before we go there, I just need to make an announcement that the deadline for submitting applications for next year's Become Good Soil Intensive is fast approaching on November 1st. So guys, if you started the application but haven't finished, get those completed this week. And if you wanted to apply but haven't, this week is your last chance. And you can find out more at becomegoodsoil.com backslash events. I just needed to make that announcement before we get rolling. But I do want to get rolling now. And what we want to do is go back to Isaiah 40, which is sort of our our pillar from last week, and just repeat some of the themes of that to build momentum into this week. Yeah, this is so good. Begins, you who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. Okay, so we let out with that passage last week as we were talking about the fear and the anxiety and the doubt that had been creeping in, even in our own hearts, towards the future, towards culture, society, where are we going? And and like last time, we know that we have many, many international listeners, and the things that we are talking about here are not only relevant to the U.S. Right. And, and to the election that's coming next week, but we are talking about the sovereignty of God his heart for the world, and his deep involvement in human affairs. So last time, as we were trying to get eyes on Christ, hearts on Jesus, he had a couple questions for us. Do you remember what they were? Yes. Yeah, he he asked us, me, you, listeners, 
What are you afraid of? And I, I had to stop on that one. Right? <laughs> like, really? You really want to know the answer I to know. that, Lord? I'm afraid the world's blowing up. I'm right? afraid of what's going to happen. Going in hell in a handbasket. Yeah, all that. And then he also followed that up with a very important question. He said, do you trust me? That was very exposing for me. Do you trust me with the election? Do you trust me with your city, your country, your community? Do you trust me? It was really, really disruptive. I have a question for you, yeah. John. Do you find it easier to trust God, say, with our finances or with our children than you do with world events or vice versa? Oh, that's a really good question. I think, I think because we have seen God work so powerfully, we've seen so many prayers answered yes. on, on intimate levels. Mm -hmm. Not only in our family, but you know, in our friends, in in our constituents, and just the fellowship of God, neighbors. We we've seen so many answers to prayer over the years that it is easier for me personally to see the loving heart of God on an individual level than it is for me to see it on a global scale or, or on a national scale. Like, that's harder for me, and I think it is harder for most people. Yeah, it requires something else. Yeah, it does, which is why last time we spent the bulk of the podcast reading Scripture to just remind us who God is. Right, orient ourselves to, to the truth. Yeah. So, as we turn into this week, friends, this really is a part two. If you hadn't had a chance to listen to the, the previous, you might want to just pause this and go in your podcast library and grab that one. What are you afraid of? Do you trust me? And then I felt Jesus add an additional question for this week. He said, ask me what I'm doing in the world. Ooh. And I think that I think that's for each of you, friends. Like God would love to have a conversation with you. He'd love to reveal to you. Ask me. Yeah. Ask me what I'm doing right. in the he world. He talks to his friends. He he wants us to know. And as we've been traveling through the pandemic and the racial tensions, the upheaval of the world, we've been sharing on the podcast that we deeply believe God has said to us, I'm shaking. I am sifting. He is exposing our fears. He's exposing the world's divided allegiances. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still going on here. Absolutely. We, we recognize it when COVID started. And that, and that was scary, you know, and not knowing and the uncertainty and stay in your homes. And, and to a greater and lesser degrees, that has not ended. No, no. I mean, the, the world's locking back down. Yes. And so add to that the divisiveness that's spreading all over mm. our nation. And the world. And the world. And the vehemence in it. It's not just we have a difference of opinion. Yes. It's like that whole spirit of hatred that has been released. Yes. So it's... Um, it's pretty dark. It is shaking. He is calling us in a time like this, eyes on me, yes. hearts on me. And so we do want to unpack things a little bit more this week, get our eyes fixed on Jesus. And in order to do that, to also be honest about the moment we're living in, to be honest about the importance of this American presidential election, the climate that we are living in right now, the divisiveness, the level of hatred, and the censorship that is taking place because, man, when you shut down freedom of speech, right? when you shut down freedom of conscience, like there is a movement to literally control not only what you can say and not say, but what you should think and not be thinking. And that is very troubling, like gadzooks. Right. And it seems to be getting kind of extreme. 
And maybe it has always been extreme, and I just wasn't aware of it, you know? No, no, it's, it's, it's over the top. Whatever your positions are in this particular election, I think for the followers of Christ, the, this concern about the freedom of speech and the freedom of conscience is something everyone shares. Th- this is a very, very troubling development that, uh, of course, people disagree with you. And, of course, they can disagree with you passionately. But when you are forbidden to speak— when you cannot voice your opinion at all. Or if you do, yeah, sure, you can voice it and immediately lose your career. We do not want this happening to our world. We don't want this happening in our country. And the, the need to pray the love of God yes. And the kingdom of God into our world and into our cities and communities for all listeners of this podcast around the world. And we are going to share in some prayer at the end. I think that's the most effective thing we can do today. Absolutely. I want to share a story of a neighborhood that I feel is doing it right, where um, a gal lives in one house. And to her left, on top of the, her neighbor's roof, is this huge Trump sign. Like, she doesn't even know how it got up there. Like, Mary Poppins landed and put it up there. And then her neighbor on the other side is, I've got Biden and Harris signs all over their front yard. Uh, passionate. Well, as you drive by, you might think, oh, conflict. But what you don't know is that these neighbors have lived there for 15 years. They water each other's plants when they're gone. They have picnics together as a family. They play together with their children. They love each other. And and this kind of civil discourse, this this ability to disagree but still love one another. Yes. That's what we want. Yes, it's huge. It's so important. It's important to the moment, important to the next, you know, week, and important to afterwards. So I, I had a I had a fascinating question come to me for us all to consider this week. What will you do if the other side wins? What, what, what will you do? What will be, I mean, you can feel your emotional reaction right now. And, and this is why we're trying very hard as disciples of Christ to start with Jesus. Yes. Get our hearts back in line with his, get our eyes fixed in his eyes. Because what will you do, friends, if next week the other side wins? Right. What, what are you standing on? On what are you firmly planted? How, yeah. how much will you be thrown or feel like, oh, all is lost? Because that sifting and shaking that God is doing in the world is taking place still. Mm-hmm. And what he is doing is exposing our divided allegiances so that we will not be divided and, and really be centered in him. And, and again, I mean, let's just point out, we may not even know the winner right, next week. Right. I mean, it's guaranteed that this, this will be is, contested. Yeah, this is contentious. Okay, yeah. so here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to read Psalm 89. Okay, let me begin. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea when its waves mount up. You still them. You crushed Rahab like one of the slain. With your strong arm, you scattered your enemies. The heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. You created the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon sing for joy at your name. Your arm is endowed with power. Your hand is strong. Your right hand exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name 
all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. For you are their glory and strength, and by your favor you exalt our horn. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Ta-da! Okay, doing better now. <laughs> yeah. It just reminds me that, you know, okay, though the earth be shaken, though the mountains fall away, God is not shaken. Yes. We have a firm foundation yeah. in Jesus. Like, oh, oh wait, wait. You know okay. what? I was actually going back to that Bethel song. It, it was an uh, album or two ago, their We Will Not Be Shaken album. Uh-huh. And that first song. The title song, We Will Not Be Shaken. Yes, that's so good. Let's go poem and play that. Might be good to go back to that, friends. Okay, Psalm 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And within the psalm, he responds. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. And then I went back to the message translation to just hear it again in different wording. I've already run for dear life straight to the arms of God. So why would I run away now when you say, run to the mountains, the evil bows are bent, the wicked arrows aim to shoot under cover of darkness at every heart open to God? The bottoms dropped out of the country. Good people don't have a chance. But God hasn't moved to the mountains. His holy address hasn't changed. He's in charge, as always, his eyes taking everything in, his eyelids unblinking, examining Adam's unruly brood inside and out, not missing a thing. He tests the good and the bad alike, If anyone cheats, God's outraged. Oh, man, like, God is involved. God has not abandoned the nations of the world. He hasn't abandoned our communities. He loves justice. He loves righteousness. And people don't get away with fooling God. They don't. Mm -mm. They will not escape that. And... The shaking going on in the world is, is God unsettling people's lives and our false gods, our false comforters, and getting us back to him. Right, right. And we're not saying that he's causing it, but we are saying that he is using it. My goodness, is he? I was reading in Daniel 2 this exclamation of God's involvement in the world. And just to set the stage for the verse, you you all might remember Daniel's been exiled to Babylon, and he finds himself in a high-ranking position in Nebuchadnezzar's palace. The king has had a dream. He doesn't understand. He's asking his interpreters uh, to interpret it. And no one can but Daniel. But what happens is Daniel rushes back to his room and he gets, he gets his three friends and he says, the king's going to kill us if we can't interpret this dream. We've got to ask God to give us the interpretation. God does. And then Daniel says this, praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in darkness, though he is surrounded by light. 
I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength. You've told me what we've asked of you. You've revealed to us what the king demanded. And I love that for several reasons. God is in control of world events. He sets up kings. He brings them down. He determines the course of nations. And then earlier, Jesus had encouraged us to ask him a new question. And the question is, what are you doing, Lord? And here's Daniel rejoicing in, you revealed it to me. You showed me that God would love to bring you into his counsel. He would love to tell you what he's doing in the world. And so, as we think about next week, as Stace and I said last week, none of this is to minimize the significance of this election. We, we think this election is immensely important. We think it's very serious. So we urge everyone to vote. But I want to tell you another fun story. I was chatting with a beautiful young woman several weeks ago, lover of God, follower of Jesus, not, not a casual Christian, a full-on disciple of Jesus. And she was confessing to me that the sentence was, Jesus is messing with my politics. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved that. I loved that because it reminded me of Lewis's famous quote now, C.S. Lewis saying, the most practical political decision you can do is convert your neighbor. Oh, yes. Jesus is messing with my politics. Friends, are you open? to Jesus messing with your politics? Like, like, are we asking? That's all I'm asking. Are we asking God his opinion on these things? Because we get so passionate. I'm, at first, I'm confessing. I get so passionate about these things that I can assume that my positions are, of course, the positions of Jesus. Right. Without ever actually asking him. Right. We, we need to ask him. We talk about being wholly converted, and we want our, our politics to be converted. Like, that Jesus gets to rule everything in our life. He gets to rule our finances. Yes. That's a tough one, man. When that— Choices when those, and spending. Ooh, when those lessons begin, that, that's a hard class in discipleship. And I, I'm not pretending I'm through it, but letting him into your finances when, when he gets into family relations and some of the difficult choices you end up having, you know, drawing some boundaries and changing family plans and trips and right, things. Right, right. Letting him into our style of relating. Yeah. Yeah, all of it. He all wants access life. to everything. All and of that's our life. that's a beautiful posture to have. It is. It's so beautiful. So, yes, Lord, of course, you can speak into my politics. Yes, we, I we want, want to align our thoughts with your thoughts. I want to know. I surrender my presumptions. I surrender my assumptions. I surrender my passion. Of course, I want to know. I'm going to make only one risky suggestion. Last night, Stacy and I, it was Sunday night, and we just needed some downtime. We needed some Sabbath, and so we decided to watch a movie together, and we rewatched the uh, Churchill film, Darkest Hour. Yep. It's an incredible film. First off, it's incredibly so well, well made. Yeah. I mean, the cinematography is just so exquisitely done, and the acting's incredible, and it's a true story um, about the days around Churchill becoming prime minister after Neville Chamberlain and Hitler's conquering Europe and those awful, awful, awful tense moments in yeah. the world. Yeah. And you picked it. You're like, I want to watch that. Yeah. Why? Beyond the quality of the acting, and by the way, Gary Oldman won Best Actor for this, an Academy Award for it. It's it's just um, it's the intensity of the time, the critical moment, and we know we know the outcome. We weren't living in it, not knowing the outcome, but knowing the outcome, just being in it and and seeing the integrity and the strength and the difficulty of standing against the tide. Mm. 
it's just powerful. It's so powerful because the Christian always finds themselves in a really awkward position in what we call, quote, the world. And at some points, our values intersect, and at other points, they do not. And I love the epitaph on Athanasius's tomb. Athanasius was one of the great defenders of the faith in the fourth century, Council of Nicaea. He made a heroic stand for the divinity of Christ, and, and he, he was a remarkable friend of Jesus, standing in a really difficult hour. There are only three words ascribed to him, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. And it, it just reminds us that we will always fit somewhat awkwardly and uncomfortably into the prevailing political climate, whatever it may In be. The social climate, all of it. Yeah, all of it. And, and so Jesus gets to mess with our politics. He gets to because he's Lord and we want him to. So if you haven't seen Darkest Hour or if you haven't watched it for a while, I've actually seen it five times <laughs> because it speaks. It, it is such a powerful moment, true moment in history. And what do you do in difficult times? And what do you do when parties are so misaligned? And how do you stand? How do you stand? So what we want to do this week is pray. We, we want to pray together because I think we can all come together and the fascinating thing is, friends, we've got listeners on both sides of the aisle here. We, we've got listeners who are going to vote for Biden, and we've got listeners who are going to vote for Trump, and we've got listeners who are going to vote for other parties and people. And we have listeners that are going to write in Jesus into their ballot. <laughs> but we can, all, we can all agree on prayer. Yes. That we want to we pray for our country, and we want to pray for the world. Mm -hmm. We can agree on that. And we can agree on some very simple things. We, we are in agreement that God would intervene. Yes, we want him to intervene. When I was upset about this several weeks ago and not quite sure what to pray, Jesus said, ask me to intervene. <laughs> I'm like, yes, bingo, there it is. Yes, Lord, please intervene. We can agree with the Lord's prayer. Amen. Yeah, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, yes, Lord, we can agree on that. We can agree for truth. Yes, for truth to be revealed and to reign. We can agree for truth. There is a great deal of misinformation in the world right now. And, and again, just pausing for a moment back to the censorship thing, like— People are having to disguise their emails about COVID right now, like putting asterisks between the letters. And if you are, for example, someone who is concerned about vaccines being mandatory, like, like that's getting censored. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's madness. Doctors are being censored. Contrary, Op contradictory. view, yeah. gadzooks. So like, let there be light. Let there be light. God yes. is light. Yes. I want you to read some of those passages. Yeah, Psalm 119, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Or how about the Lord is my light and my salvation? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Jesus is called the light of the world. In John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. We want light. We want truth. I think we can all agree on that. We want God to intervene. We want his kingdom to come. We want truth and not falsehood, not deceptions. And we want peace. We really want peace. And, hon, I thought you had a really important insight on this of praying peace for afterwards. Yeah, for after the election. like, And for us not to be in, in fear over what may happen but for a spirit of peace to yes. reign in us and to reign in our nation. Yes. 
Like, come, come, Prince of Peace. Come, Prince of Peace. Yeah. So I think these things we can all agree in, and I think this is where as Christians we we can rally together yes. in prayer. Yes. So let's pray. Yes. Oh, Father, King of heaven, you haven't moved to the mountains. Your holy address hasn't changed. You are the Lord God Almighty, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We invoke you and ask that you would intervene. We ask for you to intervene, Jesus, by your power, by your spirit, that you would come and and have your way in the United States. And even in this election, we pray and ask for your intervention. God, we do pray for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done. You are actually creator of the heavens and the earth, and so all things belong to you. And the scriptures say that when God exalted you to his right hand, he placed all things under your feet. Jesus has right to the hearts of the people of the United States. And so come, claim your right, Lord Jesus. Exert your lordship here. We want your kingdom to come. Your kingdom is beautiful. Yes. Your kingdom is so good. Your kingdom is filled with love and righteousness. Your kingdom is filled with mercy and truth. Yes. Let your kingdom come, Lord. Come into our communities, our nations. Come into this election. Yes, Jesus. And you you are the God of truth. You desire truth in our inmost being. And Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, we pray for truth to prevail. We pray for things that are hidden in darkness to come into the light. Jesus, we pray for truth, God. Yes, we pray for the exposing of all things. Yes, God. Lord, let there be light. May all things be brought into the light, God. We pray to be a people who are not in darkness, but a people who walk in the light. And we pray for light to this country. We pray for light and truth into the election and all facts around it. Yes, God. And we pray for your peace to come and to prevail. Jesus, there's all kinds of um, warnings going out about what might occur after the elections, regardless of who who wins the presidency, Jesus, no matter what, we pray for peace. We pray for peace in our nation, peace amongst the people, peace amongst people with different factions and different passions and um, different viewpoints and beliefs, Jesus. We pray for peace, God. And God, we want to ask your forgiveness. Yes, Lord. We ask your forgiveness for our tribalism. Mm-hmm. And our hostility. Yes, God. The, the, we've allowed in a level of acrimony and strife and hatred, and we repent on behalf of our country. Yes, God. We repent of falsehood. We repent of hatred. We repent of deception and control. Yes, Jesus. We repent of selfishness and yeah. pride. Right, and we repent of censorship, Lord, and silencing important voices and information. We repent on behalf of this country, asking you to intervene, and we release the kingdom of God and the love of God into this election. We release truth and light We ask you to intervene, God, and we declare your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is always done beautifully and perfectly in heaven. We ask your hand, Father. We ask your lordship, Jesus. We are asking, come and be Lord. Come and be Lord in the human heart and therefore in human actions before, during, and after the election. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen? Yeah, amen. Okay, amen. Amen. 